God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Turning to Mary, the mother of the Lord, and our mother, we ask her to intercede for us with her divine spouse, the Holy Spirit, that our minds might be filled with light, that our wills might be strengthened. Together we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. End game. End game. The final assault on the city of God. Let me begin by reading to you from the Gospel of St. John. Jesus then said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been in bondage to anyone. How is it that you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. A little while later, further on in this reading, Jesus tells them, You are of your father, the devil. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. I have always found it interesting that Jesus links lying and death. Your father is the devil. He is a liar and the father of lies, a murderer from the beginning. This weekend I'm going to speak to you about what I consider to be possibly at, at this juncture in history uh, the, the most essential thing to be aware of in the battle, and we are at war. We are very much engaged in the spiritual combat. St. Paul talked about it in Ephesians 6. It has been going on throughout history. It's nothing new, but the battle is intensifying. You know, when you have a war, battles come and go. There can be hundreds of battles fought in a war. This war has been going on through history, battle for souls. All kinds of tactics involved in this battle. It's, it's a great thing today, you know, I, uh, not everything about technology is good, but there are some good things about it. One of the good things about it is you can look up just about anything. If I had had the benefit of the internet when I did my doctoral thesis in theology, uh, I think I, I could have gotten a lot more done a lot faster. Everyone is different, you know that. Every one of us is given different gifts by God. 
Every one of us has a mission in the church. Um, you have one, I know you do. And I have one too. Now I wouldn't be any good at your mission. I have often said that um, God didn't allow me to be a parent because he didn't trust me enough. <laughs> Too big a job for me. Uh, so, but he did let me be a priest, so, so that's something. And he works through me in a unique way, just like he works through everybody else in a unique way. Uh, grace builds on nature. All of us have a certain nature, and when I say nature, you know we have certain strong points, certain weak points. Uh, grace builds on nature. You start with the nature you're given. God gives you grace, and it builds on that. Now, now I can't help it that if uh, from, from infancy, uh, the only games I played were war games. <laughs> I have often argued with God, including this week, uh, about why on earth he has me doing this. I, am, I do not have the right, I, I, don't, I don't think I have the right temperament to be a priest. I'm just too ornery. <laughs> I, I really am. And I, and I still think in categories that, you know, I stop myself. I don't blame you if you would think this. I'm, I'm letting you know I think this too sometimes. I said, what, what am I, what kind of a guy does God know what he's doing? Well, he does, of course. He does. And he works in mysterious ways. But I think in these categories of combat, battle, strife. So I went on the Internet and I looked up military tactics. <laughs> and it was most enlightening. The way that Jesus taught... And the way that many of the saints, and, and certainly the apostles, uh, was analogically, you know, they, they used parables. You know how our Lord used parable stories to convey uh, uh, something, a deeper meaning? This is a reality that's hard to convey. Hard to convey to people. They just won't believe it. And so I have to trust in the Holy Spirit that you and I together are going to launch out into the deep. This series will go all over the world. I'll guarantee you, uh, people in Japan, and England, and Ireland, and Poland, all kinds of places, this will come to them in time. And we'll trust the Holy Spirit to do this the way he wants us to. But we've got a war going on, a spiritual war. You can take many things from the natural order, use them to illustrate what's going on. There is a continuity, a oneness in all of creation. Uh, that being the case, let, let me just start at the point where it all starts, the Most Holy Trinity. Now, I know that you, most of you are, are, are Catholics who know your faith pretty well anyway. Basic, basic, basic faith. One God, right? Uh, when we say the creed, we believe in one God. Now, I'm going to go into this more. Don't be put off if I'm going, if I, you think I'm going into metaphysics a little too much. I promise you, you will understand it. I pro Everybody's a philosopher. There's not a single person on the face of the earth who isn't a philosopher. Oh, you may not teach in a university, but you are a philosopher. You have a philosophy. You believe certain things. You hold to certain principles. You're a philosopher. Basic to human nature. You'll get it. B believe me, I'm not going to talk over your head. You will ha by the time I get done, I don't intend this conference to be any different than any other one that I've ever done in my life. And no one has ever gone away from something that I've done shaking their head, not knowing what I said. They might not like what I said. <laughs> but what I said will, was clear. There is one God. That does not, by the way, mean just numerically one. That is true. It doesn't mean two. There's only one God, but it means much more than that. We'll go into that in a little while. That one God is three divine persons. Now, from this, this is the beginning 
of all that is, right? God's the creator. There's, there was never a time where God didn't exist. Remember what God said up on the mountain to Moses from the burning bush? I am who I am. And we have intuited from that, from that, that, that self-expression of God's name, I am who I am, Yahweh. God's very essence is to exist, pure act. God is, absolutely speaking. Everything else comes from the Creator, contingent being, as we say. So there's God, and then there's everything else. All right. Basic theology here. You may not know this part of it, but you'll have to take my word on it. Wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two must be. Okay, you can follow that. God is one. All right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Wherever the Son is, there the Father and the Holy Spirit must be in virtue of what we call the divine perichoresis or circumcision. You don't have to worry about those words. Don't, you don't have to remember them. But remember the concept. One God, three divine persons. Wherever one is, there the entire trinity is made present. That is going to be a very, very important first principle from which we proceed in the rest of this. St. Thomas Aquinas, a great, great mind, perhaps the greatest in the history of the church, certainly one of the two greatest, I think, anyway, uh, was a great, certainly great theologian, but a great philosopher as well. One of the greatest errors that has been made in recent times, and when I say recent, the last hundred years or so, one of the most horrendous errors, tactical error, strategic error made in the church is when we stopped requiring very rigorous philosophy before theology. Christian metaphysics, realist, Thomist philosophy are the hands which enable you to grasp theology. Without it, you're adrift, and it's very difficult very difficult to grasp it. That error, not requiring very rigorous teaching in philosophy, has resulted in, in a catastrophe in theology. There are a great many persons who go by the name of theologian who are not. And the, it can be traced back to the fact they never got philosophy. They never really went into it. They never acquired the hands needed to grasp theology. And it went downhill from that point on. St. Thomas talked about what we call transcendentals. And I'm going to try, I'm not going to give a rigorous lecture in philosophy here. That's not my intention. But I'm going to try to draw on it uh, to make an analogy, speak at times metaphorically, and, and it's valid. One God, three divine persons. Wherever the Father is there, the Son and the Holy Spirit. The transcendentals we, we talk about. We talk about being, existence, okay? Uh, uh, being itself. St. Thomas said that is convertible with certain other realities, like that which is true. These are things which are true for all of being, not just for a giraffe or a human being, all creation. These, in a, these things, in a sense, mirror the Creator. God doesn't have things. God is truth. God is goodness. God is beauty. God's very essence is to exist. We see that reflection of the Creator in all of creation. This end game as I'm calling it. This final strategy of the enemy is an attack on existence. Can't attack God himself. God is impassable. Can't hurt God. But we are created in the image and likeness of God. So what's the next best thing? You can't go after God directly. Go after 
his children. Now, you and I know, now many of you are parents and grandparents, you have children. If I wanted to get to you, if I were a bad guy, and I wanted to get to you, yeah, you got it. That's right. I think that's, I, it came to me a while back that the reason, one reason, one reason priests in the Latin Rite are not permitted to marry, it's a strategic reason, a tactical reason. If I had children, biological children, guess how the devil would get at me? Oh, he'd have leverage. He'd shut me up in a hurry. Just like if I took one of your children and held a knife to their throat. You'd do whatever I want you to do. We're dealing with a ruthless enemy. We are God's children. Now, God is beyond all that, but he loves us. I'm, I'm using an analogy here. You love your children, God loves us. You have a dim intimation of the love of God because you know how, how you can suffer, in a sense, for your children. You say, well, God can't suffer. You're right. God is impassable, by definition. But God did suffer. Well, that's impossible. God can't suffer. He's Jesus God. Yes, he's the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Did Jesus suffer? Yeah, through his human nature. So can we say God suffers? And if you know what we're talking about, yes. In his divinity, per se, no, he can't suffer. It's impassable. But God, through his human nature, Jesus, divine person, through his human nature, experiences suffering. It's a mystery. It's a paradox. Okay? How does the devil, in a sense, lash out at God? He goes after us. Those made in the image and likeness of God. This end game, this strategy... For, now, I think ultimately the devil knows he can't win, but pride blinds him. You may say, why does he bother? Doesn't he know he's beaten? He was beaten at the cross. Yes, but there's a pride. His malice exceeds everything else. There's a pride that blinds him. And so he tries to do as much damage as he can in the time that he has. And his time is short, and I believe he knows it. I remember once a saying of the... One of the desert fathers, a novice, went to him and said, Father, will they be like us in ages to come? You know, will, will they be as rigorous like, like we are? Will they pray like we do? You know how we stay up all night and pray? Will they fast like we do several days a week? And the old monk, as though looking into the future, said, Oh, my son, no, in the age to come, men will become so weak that they will be scarcely able to keep vigil one night without falling asleep. They'll, they'll scarcely be able to fast for one day without fainting. But ah, they will be greater than we. For we fight Satan chained. They will fight Satan unchained. And when I read that the first time, I couldn't help but thinking, is it now? Have we arrived, perhaps? The devil's a strategist. Now, there are many people who will see this, who will think that I, they'll immediately dismiss me because I talk about the devil. Um, it's a matter of faith. It is not merely an abstraction. It is not merely a principle. It's a person. Satan is a fallen angel. And there are many, many, many others that fell with him. Jesus said, I watched Satan fall like lightning. And he took a third of the stars of heaven with him. Well, how many is that? Well, we don't know. It's a large number, no doubt. They're active. The devil is a real spiritual being, perverse and perverting. Now, I'm getting old, and I don't have time for people who refuse to believe what the church believes. It's a doctrine of the faith. It's there. It's reality. If you don't like it, sorry. I don't like it either. 
but it doesn't change it. We've got an enemy, many enemies, and that's the nature of the battle, spiritual combat. The devil attacks all creation. He wants to destroy it all, most of all us. Strategic attack. What's the tactic? Well, there are a lot of military tactics. I looked up on my little internet research here. Now, in a spiritual sense, as I, as I read this list, you think for a minute. I know you're spiritually astute people. Now, just think about this. Ambush. Wow. How many times we've seen an ambush set by the devil? Ambush. Blitzkrieg. You know what that word means? Blitzkrieg from World War II, lightning war. Man, you hit them so fast and so hard, they don't know what happened. I blinked my eye. And I went from a little boy eight years old in a, in a, in a beautiful, pristine, innocent country. Well, about the worst thing on television was howdy doody. <laughs> and I won't, I won't talk about the halftime show at the Super Bowl. <laughs> because that's mild. That's mild. That's nothing compared to what you can get on TV any night of the week. If you've got a satellite dish, or, you know, some of the stuff's unbelievable. I blinked my eye and it went from light to dark. It's a lot of heaven then, a lot of hell now. Well, we've still got heaven around, but it's harder to find. The battle is intensifying. Crossfire. Boy, we've been caught in a crossfire for decades. Deception and misdirection. Frontal assault. Pincer movement. Flanking movement. All of these are tactics. And we'll talk about some of them in the course of the next few hours or so we have together. I believe that as we've moved through time and space, as creation has moved through, through the century, especially as man has moved through the century, as God's plan has unfolded, imagine it a, a military column moving through the desert in the fullness of time. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. The incarnation, redemption, our time. All of a sudden, the column is hit. Flanking movement from the left and the right, the front and the rear. It is those points of attack that will be my conferences in the next few hours. Existence itself, moving through time and space, hit in the truth, hit in the good, hit in unity, hit in beauty. Those are the transcendentals that St. Thomas talked about. They're convertible terms with being. Existence, life. If you attack the truth, now remember, we're going to use this analogy I gave you, the Trinity, how where one per, wherever one person is, there the other two are. If I attack the truth, I am attacking the good. If I attack the truth, I am attacking beauty. I am attacking unity. I am attacking life itself. Take any one of them. Attack them. You attack the whole. You attack every one of them. This is the strategic movement, the end game, the devil's plan. When I was in the army, they taught us basic things to keep us alive. If you're in a war, first thing, you better acknowledge that you're in a war. If you think that it's a game of checkers, you're not going to be much of a soldier. 
A soldier has to know weapons, tactics, strategies. Why? Stay alive. Win the war. 99% of Catholics don't know anything about this. Nothing. And that's the reason the world is rotting out from underneath us. We Catholics, we don't even know there's a war going on. And you, you say, oh, you're being kind of hard on us. No. 75 to 80% of Catholics in North America don't even go to Mass on Sunday. 75 to 80 percent of Catholics in North America don't even go to Mass on Sunday. Mass is a precept. You've got to do that. Mass is a bare beginning. It's a good thing to do. You need to do it. But it's not like you've arrived once you decide to do God a favor and show up for church on Sunday. And some people, you know, that's the, the, you, that's the attitude you get. You know, well, I go on Easter. Well, I always tell them, good, good, I'm glad. I don't, you know, I'm, hey, I'm ha now I'm happy. Anything I can get, I'm happy. <laughs> and so I don't, I never, I don't never, never say anything negative to anybody like that. You meet people where they are. You know, you, you go once a year, God bless you. There's a 10 million other people who don't even go once a year. So that's a good start, you know. Accentuate the positive. <laughs> Attack on unity. Attack on truth. Attack on the good. Attack on beauty. Attack on life itself. They are interconnected. They are compenetrated. People used to make fun of me. I, I used that word from the beginning of my preaching. That's a, that can, it's kind of a word that we use in metaphysics. It's a very good word. Uh, but you understand what I mean by that word. I gave you that analogy of the Trinity. When I say compenetrated, you know how the Trinity is one. Wherever one person is, there the other two. That's what it means. Okay. Wherever the Father is, there's the Son and the Holy Spirit. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, there's the Father and the Son. Wherever the Son is, there's the Father and the Holy Spirit. Okay? There, there's a, they, they are indissolubly one. One God. Three divine persons. Existence. Good. True. Integrity or unity. It's the same thing. An attack on any one of those flanks is an attack on the whole, an attack on life itself. This is very important, and you'll see as we go along. Unity. We'll start with the attack on unity. Well, let's, do, let's do some definitions first. Very simple. Don't, as St. As Teresa would say, don't break your head <laughs> trying to remember this. You know, when I learned this, a long, a, one of my professors, a very great professor, taught me this. He said, the reason people can't remember anything is because they, they get so tense at the fact that they have to remember it that they can't. <laughs> it's not that hard. Your mind is like a computer. It really does work. Uh, you don't, don't force it, though, you know. <laughs> Unity. The unity I'm talking about, transcendental unity, it's more than quantitative unity. When I say quantitative unity, you know, that's like, we believe in one God, that numerically, one as opposed to two or three. That's quantitative unity. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is undivided, simple, integrity, okay? That's the unity that we're talking about here. When we say a person is whole or integral, it means they're healthy. Everything's working right. You know, your mind, your body, your, circulate, your circulatory system, the respiratory system. There's an integrity, and everything is fine. Uh, disintegration would be the tendency toward death. 
integration tendency toward life. Okay? So that's what, when we're talking about unity in this philosophical sense, and I'm just giving you this as a basis. I'm not going to give you, honestly, I'm really not going to give you a philosophy lecture. But this, it's simple. It'll help. Integrity. You can understand that, I think, I hope. Truth. God is the truth in whom all truth subsists. I am the way, the truth. I am the truth. It, it is... I, very early in my reconversion to the faith, and it's no merit of my own, I did nothing, nothing meritorious in this sense. God gave me a love for the truth. I don't know how he did that. He did it in the way that he does things. Put it inside of me. I didn't get it superimposed from the outside, but I had some kind of intuition, some kind of sense and interior knowing that the truth isn't merely something. It is hard to love something. Easier to love somebody. The truth is not an abstraction. The truth is not a mere formulation found in a book, even a good book. The truth is Jesus Christ. Hard to love an abstraction. Much easier to love a person who loved us first. The truth is Jesus. That's the place to start. Now, if I talk to you in that way, I know you can understand. I know you believe that. And that's where we have to start. All the philosophy, the metaphysics, comes from that. What, what did it all start with? God. Before anything else, God is. Then God said, fiat lux. Let there be light. Everything came into being because God willed it. Came from the divine mind, the idea, you know, humanity, you and I. Came from the mind of God. This is very important. It, it sounds very, very ridiculously simple to us, but in the last several centuries, there has been a terrible assault on philosophy and thinking in general. Uh, if I were going to give a philosophy lecture, I'd have to maybe start with Rene Descartes. Well, I'd have to go way before that. But if I wanted to begin with the demise of philosophy, start with Rene Descartes. He turned everything upside down with his cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. You know, that, uh, put another way, this is a watch because I think so. This is a watch because it's a watch. <laughs> Not because I think so. I may think it's a pepperoni pizza. Does it then become a pepperoni pizza? No. The truth of things, ontological truth, okay? The things have a, have a being of their own. This isn't a watch because I think so. This is a watch because it is. Now, if my mind comes into conformity. If I look at this, I say, aha, watch. That's intellectual truth. The mind perceiving comes into conformity with the thing as it is. This is a watch. If, if my mind says, aha, pepperoni pizza. No, that, that, that's intellectual falsity. That's not true. That's not intellectual truth. Preceding intellectual truth is ontological truth, the truth of things itself. Now, as we go on, this is going to become very important. This is what has destroyed theology. It's what's destroyed our ability to think. I'll give you a, a, a little example. If you want to have sex with whoever, go ahead. Subjectivism. If it's okay for you, fine, do it. You know, if you want to uh, do this, that, or the other thing at the halftime show, even if it's offensive and immoral in itself, go ahead. It's okay. Subjectivism. If I think it's okay, it's okay. If you think it's okay, it's okay. Everything's okay. You're okay, I'm okay. Wrong.
divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. You've heard that before. That's a military strategy, by the way. If I have a contingent of the enemy army, division strength coming at me, you should say moving towards a town that I hold or a bridge. Before they get there, I want to break them down into more manageable parts. So if I've got 10,000 men 50 miles away, I'm going to start dividing them. Now, I might do that physically with air power, with artillery, or if I'm really clever, I might do it psychologically. I might sow the seeds of dissension in the ranks. Psychological warfare. Scare them. You're not going to live through this. Oh, your poor little children, they'll never have a father. And then it starts to work. Division, you see? That attack on unity is an attack on strength. Now, you see it in the world many ways, especially at this point in history. Uh, some examples in our own country, the last election. Now, that was something. We never, now, you admit, we never had an election like that, right? You, you'd agree with that. I mean, you. You know, you and I have been around, I mean, some of you have been around longer than me. I've been around 56 years. And uh, I know in my lifetime there's never been anything quite like that. The country almost, and this is almost a mathematical impossibility that this would happen, you know, statistically, evenly divided, that it could be a handful of votes that much, and how divided the divisions are deep. families. If, if I said, what, what was the election, 50-50? You know, generally speaking, you know, the vote, 50-50, you know, more or less, yeah, more or less. What's the divorce rate, 50-50? 50%. That's a divorce rate among Catholics, too, about half. Half the people that get married get divorced, okay? That's what it is in this country. Division. What does that division do? Weakens. Yeah, weakens the family, weakens the country, weakens the world, it weakens everything. What happens to the children? Not always, but usually. They're up against it. You know, they're, they're starting off weakened. I come from a broken family. My father left when I was 12. You know, I like to think that explains a lot of what's wrong with me. <laughs> and it might. Not an excuse. All things considered equal, you need mom and dad both. And I think we would admit that a kid has a better chance with both mom and dad home, uh, not at each other's throat much of the time. You see, the division. Th this is something, uh, this is not something extrinsic. This is something very, very essential, very important. This is a, a transcendent reality. So there's an attack on unity. That's one of the, that's one of the flanks, okay? As the column of, of, of creation moves through time and space, as you and I as humanity is moving forward through the centuries, comes the attack of evil. It attacks the flank, one flank, unity. Male and female, he created them. No other way did he create them. <laughs> There's an attack on unity, gender male and female at each other's throats. Radical feminism. They hate men. They do. Have you ever seen a fe radical feminist who was at peace? 
Have you ever seen a radical feminist who didn't scowl perpetually? I never did. Why? They're miserable. They're unhappy. And I'm not making fun of them. There are reasons that they're unhappy. And we have to address those. But you see, the enemy strikes at you. Now, that you can't get too much more fundamental than that. Male and female is the only way he created them. And th there's this rift, and I'm not, I'm not saying in general, but there's that movement. And I don't mean just the radical feminist movement. There is a movement, very subtle at times, um, to set men and women against each other. You know, they got networks just for women now. You know, then they, they came up with a men's one, too, you know. They got the women's network, and then they said, oh, well, we've got to have a men's network, too. Great, you know. I'm coming up with a Martian network. <laughs> That's next. Right? Men, men are from Mars, or what, what was it, the book? And women are from, yeah. All right. Listen. We have differences. Here, here's the thing. Men and women. Complementary not contradictory. Male and female, he created them. Humanity can't be humanity without both. Equal in dignity, he created them. Men aren't better than women. Women aren't better than men. Equal in dignity. Here's the punchline. Not the same. There is a radical and essential difference between equality and dignity and sameness. Men and women are not the same. They're equal in dignity, but they're not the same. They are not the same physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. The differences run so deep. And that's the subject of another conference or a hundred of them. <laughs> but you see the, the, the attack on unity so at, at the at very foundations of being. It goes even deeper, that attack on gender, you know, male and female fighting at each other's throat. How, that's the exterior dimension of it, the extrinsic dimension of it. There's an interior dimension, confusion. A lot of men and a lot of women confused. Uh, women wanting to be masculine and men wanting to be feminine. Confused. Sickness. Is that just normal? No. No, it's not. And if we say that that's just fine, if that's way, the way you want to be, we're, we're selling our brothers and sisters cheap. It's not okay. Just because something is a certain way doesn't mean it's okay. There are disordered things. There are things wrong that should be addressed. And that's one of the, the major point of attack. Families, countries, gender, what else? Religion, dividing and dividing and dividing again. Jesus instituted one church. That's how it started. In the 10th century or 11th century, we had the uh, Eastern Schism. That was a division. The 16th century, the Protestant Reformation. Okay, Martin Luther wasn't all wrong, you know. Uh, he saw things wrong in the one church. There was only one church, basically, other than the, the Eastern Schism that, that had resulted in a separation from Rome. There was basically one Catholic church. And Martin Luther wasn't all wrong. Let me tell you something. When things go wrong, you're asking for trouble. When we let things go, you're asking for a host of evils to come in. Martin Luther wasn't all wrong. He saw some things that were wrong. He wasn't, he, he wasn't an error on that. He's, men, human beings, are in need of reform constantly. There were abuses. There were certain abuses taking place in the Catholic Church, you know, selling indulgences and, and other things. Um, not good. Uh, individuals who were living immoral lives, priests even, bishops even. He saw that. And so he, 
He, he, he couldn't countenance that. Was he right in that there was a reformation needed? Yes, men are always in need of reform. Why? Because they're deformed. It's plain English, folks. That which is deformed must be reformed. He made a mistake, though. He crossed over the line in trying to reform doctrine. Doctrine is not deformed, hence cannot be reformed. Men are deformed. Human beings are deformed because of sin, right? He was right. He saw things wrong. He was right in that. There were things wrong with individual human beings. But then when you carry it on, by the way, a lot of the things that Martin, that, that are attributed to Martin Luther, he never did them. He loved the Blessed Mother, by the way. Many, many things. So you, Martin Luther wouldn't recognize Lutheranism in today's version of it, in many respects. When we let things go, a host of evils are ushered in. The scandals in recent months, last couple of years. That happened. A host of evils has been ushered in. It'll pass. It'll pass. We'll survive. It's like giving the enemy ammunition. Hard enough. Hard enough to fight the, the good fight without self-destructing. Countries fighting against each other. Did you know that there are on average 80 to 100 wars going on on the face of the earth on any given day? Most of which are not reported in the media. I think the number is actually higher than that. I for, it's in the hundreds, and I, I forgot what it is. I'm safe by saying 80 to 100. There's a lot of war going on. Enmity. Countries against countries. Even allies. Now, here's, here's something. Think about this. I live in Montana now, right on the, just below Canada. Okay, I'm about an hour from the Canadian border. Half of my family comes from Canada, Quebec, French-speaking Canada, on my mother's side. I remember taking trips in the summer to visit my family up there. Um, it didn't seem like going in another country back then, 30, 40 years ago. The border was, I mean, Canada, man, it's Canada, you know, it's Canada. It's our friends, you know, our allies, they're right there. Thank God we got the Canadians right next to us, you know. Now, it's very different. I've been, every, every time I've gone to Canada, the last three or four times, it's been an ordeal. I was interrogated for three to four hours the last time. Um, now we, of course, there are reasons for things. We want to fingerprint people coming in from other people. Well, hey, there's a good reason. When you consider what's going on in the world, we have a right to be careful. But now they're doing it on. On the In the airport today, I was talking to some people who travel very widely, and they said it's almost impossible to travel in South America now. They said they've taken the fingerprinting. They really took offense at this uh, requirement for fingerprinting. He said it took us six hours to get through the process, and we missed our flight. Why? American passport. With an American passport, it used to be you could go anywhere very freely, no problems. That was indeed a passport. You would go any place with an American. You still can, but it's harder. Divisions, corporate disunity. Hmm? What can I say about the last couple of years? You read the newspapers, I guess. How about Enron? One of the biggest corporations in the world, vaporized in the twinkling of an eye. Arthur Anderson, for a long time, the biggest of the CPA firms, the international CPA firm. I got a job offer from Arthur Anderson right out of college, as I did from the other seven of the big eight CPA firms. They had a big eight in those days. Arthur Anderson disappeared in the twinkling of an eye, vaporized, gone, poof.
result column. You've got corporate scandals erupting. Uh, my own case with the medical scandal that some of you may have heard about. If you want to know how bad society is, you know, you can ask me about that. Yes, they will actually diagnose you, tell you you have a heart condition, you're dying, you need immediate triple bypass surgery. And if you are as unlucky as most people, pass through it, have the triple bypass, never know the difference, your life will be turned upside down. It'll cost you half a million dollars and you will be a cardiac slot machine that will pay off big every few years. By the time the smoke clears on this one, the second largest healthcare corporation in the United States may go in the same vapor trail that Enron went in. In 48 hours, they lost $50 billion in stock value. Corporate disunity. Professional disunity. If I, if I ever, uh, God forbid, couldn't preach as a priest, I would just shift gears and give lectures in professional ethics. And in the environment that we had, have right now, uh, there would be no shortage of work. <laughs> A after we won the federal lawsuit I was involved in in this Medicare fraud deal, I had a, uh, or an email from the biggest attorney in Los Angeles, a big law firm, and they wanted me to be a consultant on a very large case involving the same corporation. And um, I said, well, I don't really do that. I, I, I can't do that. But it, it was amazing that they wanted to pay me a huge sum of money to be an expert witness because I had immediate experience with the lack of ethics in the medical profession and in the corporate world. These are all manifestations of disunity wedges being driven. How about the wedge between the poor and the rich? The disparity growing wider and wider between the haves and the have-nots. Now, I'm not a communist. I am an American. I'm uh, a capitalist in a manner of speaking. I believe in free enterprise. I don't begrudge anybody owning property, working, and making money. Fine. But there's something very wrong. You can't hardly get health care many places. Millions and millions of people. I have a situation very close to me. You know, a family member has a certain health condition, can't get health insurance. It's not a fatal condition or anything. Can't get health insurance. In California, she couldn't get, even get in to see a doctor. So well, we'll pay cash. No, we won't see her. We, we don't see patients who don't have health insurance. We can't get health insurance. Sorry. That, there's something very wrong going on. There's a disunity that's growing. The inner cities, the affluent suburbs, disunity. These are all manifestations of the work of the enemy. Remember, an attack on unity, which results in disunity, is also an attack on truth, and an attack on the good, and an attack on beauty. And I will, as we go on, I'll draw this together and help you to understand that better. But what you have to understand is that life itself is under attack. And what that translates into, just plain bottom line English, it's your children and your grandchildren. And remember that the life that we're talking about is not merely natural life. I am talking about that, and that's part of it, but it's eternal life. That's the ultimate attack, the attack on eternal life. 
Souls are under an assault today unlike any other time in history. Technology is a great thing. I use it all the time. But it, it, it's, it's certainly been at the disposal of the enemy, too. Uh, millions and millions and millions of people are addicted to pornography, which is every bit as pernicious an addiction as heroin, and just as hard to get off of. Millions and millions and millions of people. It comes into, it can come into every household in the country. Anyone who has a computer terminal has access to all the pornography in the world because you know who, who the first ones were that were successful with websites? The porno guys. The very first. They developed it into a keen science. And those of us who talk to distressed persons and deal with broken families, sick minds and sick hearts, can tell you it's a problem indeed. This unity, an attack on goodness, is an attack on unity, an attack on truth. The truth of who we are. You know, we're created in God's image. Do you not know, St. Paul said, that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? A temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in here. Wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two are. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. That means I'm a temple of the Trinity. Absolutely good theological reasoning there. I am a temple of the most holy trinity. Why would we profane and insult the trinity with garbage? You know, if you had a nice little house and you invited Jesus here, come, come stay here tonight. And then you invited every drug dealer, prostitute, and whoever else in there, you might be doing a good thing because Jesus would end up converting them. <laughs> but that's not the point I was getting at. <laughs> Lousy analogy. You know what I mean. This is a temple of God. Treat it like that. Be pure. Be chaste. Resist the attacks on truth, on goodness, on beauty. And you'll be resisting the attack on life itself. Maintain a prayerful attitude this evening. Ask the Holy Spirit to continue to bless you. Open your mind. And we'll see you tomorrow.